Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, let's try this again. My name is Will, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor. Um, I've been doing this since March of 2020. Um, I have two weekly in-service or in-person service commitments. Um, I live in Wilmington. Um, I'm from California. And, uh, yeah. Um, so Scott Dudley asked me to, uh, come and talk with you guys. And, um, he didn't say whether he, he didn't say, Hey, would you come share your story? He said, we do the hour lead. And so I've spent the last week going, well, what am I going to talk about? Um, and of course I had alcoholic it all up and like thought of all of these wonderful things I would say. And, um, <clears throat> The only thing, at the end of the day, the only thing I can really sh- say or share with you is my experience, my strength, and I guess some hope. Um, so I'll, uh, I guess to help you get to know me a little bit better, um, like I said, I'm from California. Um, there never was like a reason for why I am the way that I am. Um, and it's been this way since, since I was a kid. Um, you know, I've got great parents, I've got a loving and supportive family. Uh, yeah, never really had a, a reason to be this way. Um, but you know, it's, it's like I was born and immediately was just not happy with life. Um, I remember I remember the first time, I remember my, I, the, the first resentment that I remember, I remember, I remember banging on my biological father's door at like, I, I think three, I think I was, I don't know if I was banging on it, but I was sitting outside of it and just screaming bloody murder for my mom. And a few years later, I, I remember my first resentment being, I, I, I asked a, <laughs> I asked the girl if she would ever kiss me and and she said yes and then she kissed me on the cheek and I was really angry because I wanted it on the mouth and I was so upset. Um, and I remember I think the first time that I learned how to change the channel. Um, I was in first grade. I, um, I had written a paper about something and the first grade teacher held me afterwards to to tell me how awesome it was. And that was, I I got high off of the attention. And so I wrote for the rest of my life. I was like, all right, that's, that's going to, I'm going to get that from that. Like, all right, cool. I'm going to be, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep doing this writing thing. And, uh, I, I can only see these things on reflection. And the only way that I could see these things was by doing a fourth step and a fifth step. And I couldn't just do one of them. I've done one every year that I've been sober. And I remember the first year that I was sober seeing people, you know, every year they would, you know, go through the steps again. Or sometimes some people, they, you know, having been through the steps once, uh, they, they use each month as the corresponding step. I remember seeing those people and like laughing at them like, oh, those silly people, they think they're doing something. Well, now three years later, that's me. Every year I go through the steps um, from 1 to 12, um, just as, as they're outlined in the, in the big book. So joke's on me, I guess. I'm going to share some things at some point. I'm going to share some things with you that I hope um, will help uh, in relation. Um, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to get too detailed about pain and misery and, and all that good stuff. Um, but if anybody would like to talk about any, any topics that I get into, please come and see me. I am beyond willing 
and happy to. Um, so growing up, uh, which by the way, um, actually, before I go any further, are there any newcomers in here? No? Okay. Um, all right, so growing up, uh, I could never get right. Hi. Hi. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was always one step forward and not two steps back, but like 10 steps back. Just forever, like, just couldn't get right. And everyone would tell me, not everybody, but people would tell me that I had all this potential and all these things, and I was so smart, and I was so talented, and and, 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 and there's nothing that bothers me more than being told how much potential I have, or how smart I am, or how talented I am. There's nothing that bothers me more, because I never understood how to unlock that. Because, I mean, hell, even today at 33, like, I'm still learning how to unlock those things. You know? And so I remember, I think I was like eight or nine when the tests started, like trying to figure out what was wrong with me, sending me to head doctors, sending me to physical doctors, sending me to therapists and psychs. And um, I had already been medicated and seeing a psych since I was younger, but I remember the prodding really started like eight or nine. Um, and, uh, there, there weren't any answers. And so eventually my mom was like, all right, so you're not doing drugs. You're not drinking alcohol. They don't see anything wrong with your body or your mind. So are you gay? And she didn't mean this like negatively. She wasn't like, oh, I can't believe my son is gay. She was like, maybe that's the reason, you know, she's looking for answers. And I was like, no, mom, I like girls. And as you can see, I paint my nails now, and that's real tough for her to struggle with or wrestle with now, um, that I still like girls, but I also paint my nails. Um, but anyway, so uh, <clears throat> she, she's asked me, I think, five different times if, if I was gay, because she's like, there weren't any other answers. Um, And my parents mean a great deal to me. My dad is my stepdad. He's been with me since I was three. Um, my mom has been with me since before I was born. And that woman will be on her deathbed asking me if I cleaned my bathroom, if I meal prepped for the week. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and if I had done my taxes. Um, <laughs> my... Uh, my family is originally from Sicily, so if there's any Italians in the room or anybody from up north, you can kind of understand what my upbringing was like. Um, my dad, my, my dad, I, my dad is my who's my stepdad. I just call him dad. Um, he's from California, um, and uh, he was raised by some crazy folks, and um, and both of my parents did their best to uh, to put down their own upbringing to, to raise me and my siblings for who we were as individuals. And that was really confusing to me because each one of us were raised differently. And I'm like, don't you think it's not fair? Treat me the way that you treat them. And my whole life, even today, fairness has always been something that's bothered me. Um, I'm better because of AA. I've gotten a little bit better with the whole fairness bit. Um, but I still struggle with it. Um, so anyways, uh, I did all the, uh, the obvious law breaking when I was a kid, when I was in high school, um, running around with kids that did bad things, uh, to other people, um, drugs and violence and, and guns. Um, it was the stuff that was obviously bad. Um, I had my first bottom. I, I, I realize now in retrospect, I was having my first bottom when I was 18 and between 18 and 19. Um, and, uh, I hadn't talked to my dad in a couple of years. My parents moved to, to Raleigh, North Carolina when I was 16. And I hadn't talked to my dad in a couple of years because we were not on speaking terms because, 
I decided to stand on some moral high ground and refuse to apologize to him, and we ended up in a big fight. And um, anyways, so I was in the midst of what I realized was my first bottom, and and he, uh, I called him. It was the only place I could, I, I could think to call. I couldn't call my mom because she would freak out, and I, you know, I wasn't trying to hurt her any more than I'd already hurt her. And uh, I couldn't call any of my friends because when you're out in that kind of a lifestyle, as you all know, um, those friends aren't really friends, you know? They're not really trying to help. So I called my dad, and uh, to my great surprise, uh, he said, come home. And so I sold everything. Obviously, North Carolina wasn't home, but being with them was. And uh, so I sold everything that I had. He bought me a one-way plane ticket, and I came to North Carolina. And I vowed that day that I would stop doing bad things to people. And I kind of did. I stopped obviously hurting people, and I started hurting people the way that I thought white people did. You know? I drank. I drove drunk. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I got drinking tickets. Um, I got in trouble at school. Um, got put on the, the bad person list in college. You know, I just thought I was just being a dumb kid, and that's just what dumb kids do. Um, the problem is, is that normal people don't go to jail. Normal people don't assault police officers. Normal people don't assault public officials. And uh, so I was acquiring quite the uh, quite the rap sheet, um, and I kept blaming it on being young. Um, so you can sum up my whole, basically my whole drinking career as delusional, insane, and selfish. I would tell you that I wanted a girlfriend, but then I would take none of the steps to actually acquire or be in a partnership with somebody. I would tell you I wanted a job, but I would do none of the things to maintain a steady job. I would tell you I wanted money, but I would not do anything to save or be consistent with money. I would tell you that I wanted a relationship with my parents and that I would never call them unless I needed them. So on and so forth. My whole life. Um, and so uh, I inevitably committed a crime that I could not come back from. Um, and I ended up in prison for two years. Um, and I'm so delusional, or I was so delusional, that I didn't realize this whole time that I had a problem with drinking. I thought I was the problem, which I was kind of right. I was the problem. But I didn't realize that in order for me to make better choices, I had to first stop drinking and doing drugs. Like, I can't <laughs> drink and do drugs and make good choices. I didn't realize that, like, there was a... You know, I, I, you know, there are people out there who can do both. They can make good choices and drink and party. I can't. Um, and so I spent two years in prison doing what I thought was getting well. I didn't drink, smoked some tunchi here and there, um, sold stuff while I was in there. Um, I thought I was working on myself by doing a bunch of that writing again. Um, but the same behaviors. Um, you know, I treated my mom like a dog while I was in prison. I called my parents every day for the two years and month or so that I was in prison. And sometimes I called my mom five, six, seven times and ran her wild. Go look for this. Get me this. Go look for this. Get me this. Move this over here. Get me transferred over here. If ever I had, if, if ever we could like sort of gloss over anything that I had ever done to my parents, I can't gloss over what I did then. It was so overtly an obvious selfish behavior. But like a good alcoholic, I had put it in a a box and a package of, you know, oh, I'm in prison. It's tough in here. Don't you understand? And I, I, tr I made it look good until something happened. And I, I, I can't remember what it was, but 
I was talking to my uncle and it was pretty obvious that my mom was hurt, hurting pretty bad. And I was like, God, man, I should probably try to be there for her. And the next time I called her, I asked her for something and didn't think to ask her about herself. And so I got out of prison and um, I lived in a halfway house for, for 10 months and uh, still didn't think that I was an alcoholic. Through all of that, not an alcoholic, no problem with drugs and alcohol, it's just me. And uh, I work in tech, I, I have a career in tech, uh, in IT. I'm thankful and grateful that it's been given back to me. It's a gift. Um, but I got out of there and I thought, yeah, I'll just, talk to them. you know, I've got these skills. I'll put them to use. Somebody will hire me. Everything's going to be fine. Me, 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 me. Um, so I didn't work a program, but I was, I was forced to go to these meetings and I'm, they, they saved my life and they, I, I didn't realize it. Um, I ended up manic, un, un, uh, untreated alcoholism does some nasty things, uh, specifically to me. Um, I ended up manic and suicidal in one of those manic breaks. Um, I nearly killed myself. I thought the FBI was watching me. I thought aliens might be real. Um, some crazy shit. I was sober as a joke, but manic because my mind is just <laughs> untreated. My mind is, I don't work, I don't work right. Um, Thank God I had been in these rooms. Um, I thought, well, I'll try doing this phone call thing just one time. And when they don't pick up, because, you know, they're not going to. When they don't pick up, then I'm justified to kill myself. And uh, thank God Dustin picked up the phone. And he picked up the phone all day. And I stole, I don't know how many hours from that man that day. Um, I realized today I was probably doing a service to him. Um, but in the moment, he was saving my life, uh, whether he knew it or not. Um, it showed me that this might could work. And from that day forward, I started trying to do what the people in these rooms do. Um, sobriety is not linear. My sobriety is not linear. Um, I didn't just magically start working the steps and magically get better. Remember that whole like potential and talent thing that I was talking about earlier? Um, I'm reminded of like earlier, younger days, or you, you hear it even now. <clears throat> the church says to pray about it and therapists say to talk about it. Neither works for me. I need action. And, and Alcoholics Anonymous gave, gives me actions to take. And it's through those actions that I learn how to unlock things within myself. Um, yes, I need to pray about it. And yes, I need to talk to somebody about it. In fact, that's two thirds of step 10. But the third piece is res it says that we resolutely turn our attention to be a service to another human being. So th throughout my day today, when I feel bad, I pray about it. I tell somebody about it and I resolutely turn my attention to be a service. <clears throat> And that's how I have the, the opportunity to unlock whatever is inside of me. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen or even happen then or whatever. I just, I've learned over time, having done this a whole lot of days, that eventually it works. And nothing else ever did. Um, so uh, I'd like to, for a moment, talk about step three, um, specifically page 63. Um, so I'm going to reread the top of page 63. Like I'm going to read it, but I'm going to, I'm going to add some words to it. Um, so it says when we sincerely, sincerely is in my opinion, the operative word here, this is the important word. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well, Est established on such a sincere footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves 
and our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in what we could contribute to life as we became more sincere, as we as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered what we that we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose fear of today, tomorrow, and hereafter as a result of sin- sincerity. So it's one thing to, to turn my life over to God. It's another thing, and it's, it's one thing to do the steps. It's one thing to be of service. All that's good and well. In fact, in the beginning, like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, I just need to make the phone call just to make the phone call. I just need to show up to the meeting just to show up to the meeting, so on and so forth. All the things that we do here. But over time, I need to become, if I'm not becoming more sincere in these actions, i.e. not doing them for me, then I'm missing the point. And so the process for me has been, it starts off, I'm trying to not die. And then I realized that I kind of like helping people, so I'm doing it for you. And the iteration that I think I might kind of be in today for now um, is I'm trying to do things for for God. And that's a weird thing for a guy like me. I wasn't much of a God person. Um, but the service that I do today, it's not for me, it's not for you, it's for God. Um, when I try to minimize myself, it's not for me, it's not for you, it's for God. Um, the second time that I went through the steps, my, my sponsor tricked me when I got to step three. He told me to write out what a good employee was, and I was to go and ask other people who either had long careers or, or had, had been through the steps. I had to ask them what a good employee was, and so I wrote a whole paper, a page of what a good employee was. When I got done reading it to him, he said, cool. Sounds like something that your employer might like because you have a new employer and it's God. I was like, whoa, I had never thought of that. I've read this book I don't know how many times and like I never realized that it says in here that we have a new employer. Um, You know, coming in, I, I got really annoyed because I would hear the same thing said over and over again. And we read the same things over and over again. And especially if you do any service at the treatment center, guess what you hear a lot of? That's one, two, three. One, two, three. And I would get really annoyed about that. But I've realized now why we do that because I never know when something's going to stick. Because I say things differently than you do and you do. We all say things differently. We're all saying the same thing, but we all say it just a little bit differently. We never know who is going to hear what. Um, so I'd like to uh, move over to some non- or some some other Bill W. literature um, because he talks about the healing circuit. Um, and so he wrote this, this article titled uh, Emotional Sobriety, The Final Frontier. Um, and so I just want to read two paragraphs. It says, I kept asking myself, why can't the 12 steps work to release depression? By the hour, I stared at the St. Francis prayer. It's better to comfort than to be comforted. Here is the formula, but why didn't it work? Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a working and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. can't do it for me or you. I have to do it for God. And that's scary. I, uh, the first time that I went through these steps, I, um, I actually ignored the God stuff. Like I lied steps one, two, and three, like step one, I was like, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll admit I'm powerless over alcohol, but my life is pretty manageable. So like I'm holding on to that one. And then step two came to believe that a power greater than myself. Yeah. Okay. We're just, I'll, you want me to say yes? Is that what you want me? Okay, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, gonna turn my will and my will and life over the care of God? Okay, yeah, sure. We're gonna lie about that too. Uh, because I've been told that I need to do this. And so I lied about this stuff. And I'm glad that I did. Um, but today I realize that everything that I do has to be for God. Otherwise, it's useless. It doesn't make the mark. 
So I, uh, so I got out of prison uh, three years ago. Um, I count my date as the date that I started trying to do things that actually made me well. Um, and uh, there are verifiable actions from day one of, of releasing from prison, so that seems like a, <clears throat> a useful date. And um, there isn't a single promise written in this book that says anything about money, property, or prestige. It doesn't say anything about getting family back. It doesn't say anything about people liking me. The promises say things like, uh, I'll have a new pair of glasses. I'll have a new perspective. I won't, I'll, I won't be insane. I won't be delusional. It says that, <clears throat> um, and, and so I found that to be true. Um, at some point I realized that I was probably never getting my career back. And so I stopped trying and I started focusing on, on, uh, on other people, on other things that give me a little bit of healing and I think, all right, cool, I got this. Now get out of my way. I'm back in charge, you know? I feel a little bit better, so get out of the way. And uh, that's been sort of the story of, of my whole sobriety. Like, I feel better, now move over. I feel better, now move over. Um, eventually, uh, in... Um, Eventually, at the end of my first year, I, I did get my career back. Um, the rap sheet that I have, having now now a felon, uh, having just gotten out of prison less than 12 months prior, um, I was given my career back. And at the time, I thought that I had earned it back. But deserve and earn are tricky words. Because I can't, I don't, if I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be dead either. I'd just be locked up somewhere. And I can't earn anything. I didn't earn the, the, the service to be able to come here and talk with you guys and share with you. I didn't earn that. It's a gift. And it helps me way more than it helps you. Um, but man, I, I thought I had earned my career back. And uh, so off I went running, you know. I don't need to think about this God stuff. Day one at that first job, I found myself hiding in the bathroom because that's what I used to do. That's where I used to go to do a little of this and a little bit of that and drink some booze in the middle of work. Because that's what I did. Because I thought that was normal. And I couldn't figure out why I was sitting in there. <laughs> like, why I was in there. Like, I don't have to pee. I don't have to do anything. Why am I in here? <laughs> and thank God I had a sponsor that I was comfortable calling. I called him. Day two, I was there. Somebody looked at me funny. I thought they knew. They know everything. They must know. So off my mind went. And thank God I had, a com I had a sponsor that I was comfortable calling because I called them. And that's what most of my, first, my, my second year looked like. I feel bad. You looked at me funny. You did something to me. Call my sponsor. Call my network. Call somebody. Um... <clears throat> And it worked. It works not because they're special. They are special people. But it, and it didn't work because I'm special. It worked because there's a primary healing circuit of giving love to get love. And I don't do it because I know it's coming back to me. I do it because it's what God wants me to do. And sometimes I give love by saying I'm hurting, I'm sick, I'm struggling, and I suck. Sometimes that's the service. The newcomer that raises their hand and says, I'm new and I don't know what to do. They're being a service. Sometimes I get to come here and do this. But anyway, so um, year two, I found out that I had a new employer. I got rigorous about step 10. Uh, became some, some people said that I became dogmatic about <laughs> the program. Um, Step 11 was a, is still a struggle for me today. Um, and step 12 has always been pretty easy for me. Coming in, I hated myself, and so serving others was pretty, pretty natural for me. Um, but if I'm doing it because I hate me, again, it's useless. I have to be doing step 12 
for God. And that's scary. That's really scary. And, and so in year two, I really um, started doing that. Um, in the middle of year two, some, some crazy things happened. Um, so I came in, as I said, not big on the God thing. I also am not, was not big on men. Um, so I guess I'll pause and say a couple of things. Uh, suicide, big part of who I am, not who I am, but things that have happened to me. Um, I've made honest efforts at suicide a handful of times. Um, I was raped for over a year when I was a kid. I'm not saying any of this for, for, uh, attention, just to relate. If there's anybody in here who has been through these things and just, um, as I already said, I've been to prison, um, and things happened in there. That was, that was a time. Um, and so I came in, no God and hate men, don't trust men, um, don't trust institutions and don't trust, uh, like government and stuff like that. Um, and so two and a half months, two and a half years into this thing, I still was not too big on men. Um, I had a sponsor, I had a sponsor network, I had a bunch of dudes in my phone, but like at the end of the day, who was I really talking to? I was talking to, I was talking to the girls. Thankfully, I, I was doing the, as best I could with that and staying away from newcomers, but still like I was not doubling down with the people that I needed to double down with. And um, so about two and a half years in, I, 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 I it was another gift. Um, a couple of guys that I had seen in and out and sort of been in my purview for a while. Um, they were gifted to, to, into my life. Um, we both became willing to hear and see each other. Um, and so I found a, a, a group of men that were, that was around me and I was able to share openly and honestly with them. And I was able to build real relationships with men for the first time in my life uh, outside of my dad. And, um, and that changed everything for me. Um, right around that time, um, a friend of mine uh, was having a bad day. And, and she, she said, can I come paint your nails? And I said, sure. I had never done this before. And, um, I figured, you know, um, it's not really for me, but like, yeah, like paint them and then I'll take it off. And I found that I kind of liked it. <laughs> and I thought, but you know, like I'm only going to do this like black nail polish stuff. And now I've got dipping dots and all kinds of crazy colors, <laughs> but I say this and I'm wearing girl pants right now. Um, and I say this not because, uh, Look at me. I say this because finding who I am has been really important in this journey. But I didn't find myself by telling you about myself, because that's what I used to do. I found myself by listening to other people. I found myself by doubling down with the men and keeping my ears open. And I learned that from my sponsors. I learned that from our big book. Um, I have been through... Dustin, Nick, Justin, and I am now on my fourth sponsor. Uh, his name is Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy is a really special person. Um, when I was three months sober, my sponsor told me I needed to get an in-service person, in, uh, an in-person service commitment. And so I did, and I went to the treatment center and they said, hey, can you not come back again? Because I was so sick. <laughs> I was so sick that um, I spent like 30 minutes of the hour talking to this guy about how I hated sobriety and I wanted to die. <laughs> and... Uh, and so Jimmy had heard about this and he was like, well, how about just like bring him over to PHP with me and we'll, we'll see what it looks like. And, uh, I spent the next six months sitting next to him once a week 
and I learned so much. He had no idea he was teaching me, and I had no idea I was learning. But for the first time, one of the first times in my life, I was actually listening way more than I was talking. The only times that I shared in those first couple months were uh, when I was directly asked the question. Otherwise, I listened. And Jimmy was teaching me how to do things. And what's really interesting about Jimmy is he looks, sounds, and is nothing like me. He comes from a place that's very different than me. And he lives a life that I could only dream of. He's got like a, a wife and kids and like a stable job. And he looks all like, I mean, it's just all, you know, his, his bottom didn't send him into prison. He doesn't have a rap sheet like mine. Old me would have looked at him and been like, you don't understand. I'm gone. Like, I, you have nothing to, to, to offer me. I realize today that Jimmy has everything to offer me because it doesn't matter what my bottom looks like. What matters is what I'm doing today. And in the face of uh, good things happening to him, Jimmy spends more time thinking about others and, and talking to God than he does talking about his car and his family and his wife and this and that. When he goes to be a service, he serves his family first, AA second, and uh, his friends third. In that order, it starts with his family and then AA. And that's something that before he became my sponsor, that's something that had become sort of a truth of mine. I was working with uh, my former grand sponsor and he was telling me how he's turned down speaking engagements so that he could tend to his sick, his sick wife. And I was like, yeah, but like you gotta do the AA thing. They say that's really important. He says, no, my family is more important than that. And it doesn't mean that that's less important. It's just priorities. And that kind of reminds me how I got started actually working steps. I was, this guy was telling me that I wasn't willing to not be sober. And I was like, yeah, but don't you understand? Like, I'm not drinking. Like, of course I'm willing to be sober. He's like, yeah, I don't think so. And for some reason I had, I had a lucid moment and I started thinking about priorities and I was trying to figure out how I could fit alcohol in to my priority list. And once I got to 10, and 11 and 12, I realized that if it wasn't in the top 10, then it wasn't a priority and I probably shouldn't do it anymore. And that was the day that I decided to never drink again. Um, character defects are funny. I don't get rid of them, but I turn them over to God. I'm not magically a, a made better human being. My character defects didn't just go away. Um, they're still with me. Some of them smaller and more minimized. Uh, some of them just as vibrant today as they were yesterday. But when they come out, I turn them over to God. And I do that 10 step thing. Pray, tell, help. Um, step nine, making amends. That was interesting. I knew my family would forgive me. And I didn't want to make that. I didn't want to make amends real quick to them because they had seen so much destruction for so long. I wanted them to see that it would, had stuck. So at first I did all the like non-family amends and none of the big amends, right? Like the dude who raped me, uh, my boss that I had when I got arrested, like those big ones that scared me. I didn't do those first either. I did everything else. I made it to a year, made amends to my family. And it took me two more years to get willing to make amends with the person who raped me. And uh, I finally reached out, didn't hear back. I might not get to make that amends uh, verbally. I might have to, to write a letter. But last weekend, um, somebody was talking about amends and willingness. Because really, I mean, you can sum up my entire sobriety with willingness. Am I willing to do these things? How willing am I? I can want it, but am I willing to do it? And then have, once having done it, am I willing to do it again without getting results? Because it's not about results. It's about my inputs and my actions. I'm not a results-oriented human being anymore. I'm an inputs-oriented human being. And so uh, this guy was talking about willingness to make amends at a meeting. And it, it dawned on me that I hadn't reached out to that boss that I had when I got arrested to go to to eventually go to prison for two years. And so I sent her a message right then and there in the meeting. I wasn't going to wait another second. And I pulled out my phone. I opened up LinkedIn and I shot her a message. 
And uh, two days later, she responded. We don't need to talk. We don't need to message. You're forgiven. But if you want to make amends, I'm happy to read it. And I was like, whoa, really? Like, you're just fine. I mean, obviously, I still have to, like, do the amends, right? But, like, you're just okay. Like, I this whole time I've been, like, she must, she has to hate me, right? Like, of all the people who, like, you know, she had no personal relationship with me. Other than being my boss, like, we were not friends. Um, I couldn't believe it. Um, so I've still got to send that uh, amends. But... Willingness is so important to all of this. If I don't, if I'm not willing to take a small step, none of it's going to come. I can't stop drinking if I'm not willing to take actions. I can't, I can't be made whole if I'm not willing to take some actions. I can't rebuild relationships if I'm not willing to pick up the phone and call. I can't have a job if I'm not willing to be consistent. Um, I, uh, I eventually had my career taken from me because I wasn't quite ready. Um, a couple things that happened in sobriety. Number one, I went to jail sober because I decided uh, I, I got real dry. I got real sick and uh, decided to start uh, violating terms of my probation. Like they weren't they weren't law breaking. I was just breaking rules because I will do anything to change the channel. Anything. It does not need to be a drug or a drink. It can be anything to change the channel. Um, so <laughs> I started breaking these rules that I knew were wrong. And um, I laugh about this now, but it's really not funny. I was really sick. And uh, so I thought, you know, first time it won't be a problem. He sat my ass in jail for two weeks. You know, some people, they can drink and drive and not get in trouble. Some people, they drink and drive and they kill people. I drink and drive and I get a DWI. It's happened four times. Some people, they can commit crimes and nothing happens to them. Some people get caught and they get very minimal repercussions. I get caught. I go to jail. There's never like, I don't, (laughs) it's just, it's just what, it's just the life that I've, it's just the cards I've been dealt. Everyone's different. You know, some people, they come in here on a real high bottom, some on a real low bottom, some people lower than mine. But I have to realize whatever, I have to realize that these are the cards that I'm dealt. And so if I'm, if, <laughs> am I willing to stay in these lines? And so I, uh, so I, I, I went to jail for two weeks. Um, I was 18 months sober. And in that jail cell, I had no service to do, no book to read. I had no phone calls to make. I was on 23 and ones. I had nothing. All I had was the tools that I had been given and I couldn't use any of them except for one and that was prayer. And all I asked God to do was to make me feel better because I felt terrible. And so every day, all day long, that's what I did. I begged God to make me feel better. Please God, take this away from me. And it didn't happen immediately. But eventually, every day, the, ch- the, the channel was changed for me. I, was made, I, was, I, I felt better at some point every day for two weeks. So I stopped denying God, and I decided, all right, I guess God's real. And uh, I shot out of there and uh, was bent on, on, on practicing these principles in all my affairs. And uh, eventually, I... I, I, I I lost a job and I went jobless for eight months. And um, for the first couple months, I uh, shoot, I'm running out of time. Um, for the first couple months, I, uh, I, 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 my, my job was to look for a job. Like that was what I did all day long for eight hours a day. I looked for a job. Um, I eventually had three job offers. All three of them were, were taken back because of my, my past. Even though I, I, I told them up front, they all knew, but, you know, when they went to go and do the paperwork, it ended up in legal, and legal said no. Um, and so finally, I burnt out on, on looking for, for work. Not, this wasn't a spiritual thing, okay? I was done and tired. Um, I decided to stop looking for work, and I went and got a job washing dishes. And I showed up, and they asked me why I wanted to do this, and I said, I just want to serve others. Nothing else works. 
The only thing I know that works is serving others. So I just want to be a good, reliable employee to you and serve others. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. And that's what I did for four or five months. And so I didn't look for a job. And then uh, it, I became uh, aware of, of an available job. And I called the company and said, hey, uh, my name is Will. Like, can, can I apply for this job? And uh, uh, a few days later, had an interview. Uh, they called me that, that day and said, hey, we've canceled all the other interviews we want for the job. I was like, well, that's great, but like, I got to tell you some things. Um, but before I could tell them those things, I was way too excited that I had just been offered the job. So I was like, cool. So I hung up the phone and <clears throat> uh, a couple days later, I uh, can't remember how this ended up happening, but um, we ended up on the phone again and uh, he was like, yeah, so we're about to run a background check. And I said, cool, let me tell you about some things on my background. And so I told him and... Uh, Long, the, the, the thing that's important about this is that I told him honestly without trying to justify anything that I did. I told him exactly what I did, <clears throat> and I told him, and, and, I, and I, didn't com I didn't comp it with, and I'm sober and doing all these other things. I just said, this is what I did. I didn't try to justify, and I didn't try to show him how good of a boy I've been recently. And he said, okay. You'll start on Monday. Okay. So I show up on Monday. So I show up on Monday, and uh, he was like, all right, so about this stuff in your past, let's talk about it some more. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, again. Like, we got to talk about it again. Like, this is not going to go well. So I doubled down. This is what I did. Nothing more. Um, and he said, all right, well, tell me about who you are today. Oh, I can tell you that now because you asked. At the end of that conversation, he said, all right, we'll never talk about this again. And we haven't. And later that day, he took me to lunch and asked me about me and took interest in building a relationship with me. And that's what the last two and a half months have looked like. I've got two bosses that care about me as a human being and go out of their way to build relationships with me. And it's the most wild thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I didn't get this job. I didn't earn this job. I don't deserve this job. But I was given it. It was a gift. It is a gift. And uh, I say that because it's important for me to remember that if I practice these principles in all my affairs, then God has an opportunity to do whatever the hell it is that God's going to do. That thing that connects us all, the love that's all inside of us, it can come out if I allow it to. But if I get in the way, I've got no chance. And uh, do I go till nine? Oh. Do you want me to cut it? Well, it is nine. Uh, I just want to talk about the. I just want to talk about fear, ego, and self, and I'm done. <laughs> All right. So I found this analogy fits. Um, uh, so you've got an elephant and a rider. The elephant is my emotions and the rider is my mind. And I've found that that rider can never force the elephant in a, into a direction left or right. And the two directions that the elephant walks are either fear, ego, and self, or love. And I can't force it to do one or the other, but obviously I want it to walk in love, right? Um, and so my whole sobriety can be summed up by trying to get this elephant to walk in love, but I can't force it and I can't trick it. The only thing that I can do is the healing circuit of love. Pray, tell, help. And when I do it enough, that elephant starts to walk in love. Thanks. <laughs>